Hello everybody, welcome to the United Stands, I'm Mark Goldbridge, let's do this, the latest Manchester United news as Ineos start their transfer raid, that is what's going on this morning, defenders, midfielders, Hulmond, Bremer, Sancho, McTominay, there's loads more to talk about on the show this morning as Manchester United get busy in the transfer story arena. Well, look, there's a few people saying, is this Bremer's story a smokescreen? Who is Holman? What is he? Is he good enough? Are we actually looking at him? And is this all just one big story to detract from what happened with Brentford at the weekend? It's the United Stand. It's all the latest news. Let's delve into it. Cut through the crap and give our opinion on it. That's what we're here to do on the 10 o'clock show. And you're very, very welcome, of course. Um... Look, I think, first of all, before we delve into the details of these individual stories, um, yeah, we've been in this position many times before. Of course we have. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Madge. Good go morning, Icom. Good morning, Isaac. Good morning, Slipwave. I'm saying good morning to the members because they support the channel. I'm not saying good morning to John Hyde. You haven't got a badge or TK1. Although I just said say good morning to them. Um, I'm joking. Right, OK. So, look, I think that we have been in this position before where we have a bad result at the weekend and then we get linked to Gareth Bale or Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, thank God we're not getting linked to them now. That would be hideous. But um, yeah, of course, there's always a bit of a spin on a Monday morning. But these are not spin stories. These are, I think these are late April. Oh, it's April the 1st. It's, it's, it's April Fool's. <laughs> I've just missed a trick. I've just missed a trick. It's April Fool's Day. Um, Man United are going to sign Messi. For two thousand billion pounds, yeah, I can't, we're, we're, we've grown up out of all that, haven't we? I, I think, I think, I think it's, um, I think April Fool's Day is funny every few years, but every year it's just boring, isn't it? Um, but look, what I was going to say is that I don't think this is smokescreen. I think it's early April. The transfer window basically is open, and talks have to be taking place with players where there's going to be competition for them. So I think the players we're going to talk about, Bremer and Hullman, are players that other clubs are going to be looking at and therefore you can't just sit back and say, let's wait till Dan Ash within June. Um, Man United had a really disappointing result at the weekend. I have an interesting take on that, actually. I think what I would say about that is that I did say going into the weekend, you want to be, you want to be at home after an international break. No Premier League team won away from home this afternoon, uh, over the weekend. Um, so no away team won on, on the Premier League this weekend. I said this on the preview for Brentford on Thursday. The rhythm, the momentum completely disappears over an international break and you want to be at home. I, 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 don't, I didn't see anybody play that well this international break, really. The Newcastle-West Ham game had a lot of goals in it, but that was because both teams weren't that good. Liverpool played well in parts against Brighton. Brighton scored an early goal and then parked the bus. Arsenal parked the bus. Man City couldn't find their rhythm. I think there's something to be said here, whether people like it or not, there is something to be said about the fact that the international break is a momentum killer. Nobody played well this weekend. But that's not an excuse for Manchester United. If anything, it, put it, it puts it more onto the players because if you contrast Arsenal at the Etihad, they didn't play that well. Odegaard couldn't pass to save his bloody life. Their passing was really bad. Arsenal's build-up play wasn't very good at all. It wasn't Arsenal be from, from before the international break. So I can forgive Man United not having much rhythm. And we didn't have any bloody rhythm. We had all the rhythm of a fucking dead seal. But the point I'm trying to make is that we didn't have any rhythm. A lot of teams didn't have a lot of rhythm. And you can say it's the international break. I understand that. And I think the rhythm will come back gradually. But what Arsenal had at the Etihad was organisation and are willing to die for that badge. They fought, they were organised and they had a structure. Man United players didn't do that. So if we can forgive the lack of rhythm, structure because of the international break, because everyone else lost that, what we can't forgive is the lack of desire, organisation and, and, and fight for the cause, which is what we saw from Arsenal, who didn't play that well, but defended really well. Man United don't bring that. And that's, on, that, that's, that's player personality. If you want a message this morning, Ineos, no team away from home played well this weekend. So, yeah, the international break was a problem. But teams that didn't play well away from home still went and fought for the badge because they've got the players to do it. We don't. We've got players who just can't be arsed. And that was the big problem at the weekend. Um, RJ says, Sancho's playing really well in Dortmund. And? 
Um, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like a fucking echo, isn't it? It's like being three years ago. Sancho looks like a good player at Dortmund. Yeah, we, we, went, we spent £75 million on that mistake. Um, let's not make it again. Can you wish my mate happy birthday? He's Italian, has a cheeky liking for Luke Shaw like you as well, says Nick Stretford Ender. Happy birthday to your mate, uh, Matteo. Um, right, OK, let's get into the transfer news. We're going to start off in Italy, funnily enough. We're going to talk about Bremer, the Brazilian Juventus centre-back. He's doing very, very well. Uh, Juventus is doing very well defensively. Uh, more reports coming in this morning that Manchester United may not even negotiate with Juventus. They may just go and pay the £50 million release clause. Um, lots of talk about Bremer over the last two weeks. We did the Hotometer show a couple of weeks ago where we have our Hotometer on who we think are the most likely signings at the moment. Uh, to give you a spoiler, it's still Elise, Branthwaite and Tadebo. Bremer does not feature. I completely understand that there are a lot of stories going around about Bremer at the moment and I completely understand that Manchester United fans may start to get excited about it or think it's going to happen. Um... And there are stories about him this morning for 50 million quid. Man United can just pay the release clause and take him to Manchester, take him to Old Trafford. But again, I can only repeat, there's nothing credible around this at the moment. It's it's paper talk. It's it's one of the five things. Is it the player trying to get a new contract at Juventus? Is it the agent trying to find him a move and using Man United? Is it the club trying to use Manchester United at Juventus? I don't know, but there is absolutely nothing out there that Bremer has taken over Tadebo or Branthwaite as the priority centre-backs for Manchester United. So quite an easy story to start off with, really, because we keep getting linked to Bremer. And look, I keep reading these articles as well, and they keep rewriting them in a clever way. I'm sure you've seen them themselves. Man United ready to move for superstar centre-back. You click it, it's Bremer again. And um, I'm bored of reading stories about Bremer because it's just not a signing that Manchester United are looking to make at this moment in time. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. If you want that type of player, then I I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, no, definitely, definitely not going to happen because he probably is on a list and I'm sure he's been scouted, but he's low down the list at the moment and he's not a player that Manchester United are pursuing in the sense of um, let's go and sign Bremer from Manchester, from uh, from from Juventus, so just it's just not there. So I'm not going to dwell on it massively because I, I just think it's a story that we can bring into the news show that doesn't have any legs in it at the moment. One story that I do find interesting is Morten Hulman, um, who is playing for Sporting Lisbon at the moment, and is Danish. Um, a few people have been talking about him. He's certainly a player that Manchester United have been scouting. Um, if you don't know much about Hulman, and I'm probably getting his name wrong. Um, Holman, I always say Hoyland because I know the D's not counted, so I'm saying Holman. It could be Holmand, um, it could be Hulmand. Um, I'm going to call him Holman, um, based on what Rasmus said is that, that you don't pronounce the D at the end, but that might just be his name. So, Morton Holman is a 25 or 24 year old, I think he's going to be 25 very soon, holding midfielder who plays for Sporting Lisbon and Denmark. Um, he is about six foot one. He is very good at passing and he's very good at tackling. And um, he is the answer to the holding midfield role at Manchester United, according to many hipsters. Now, I like this player. I don't think it is a player that Manchester United are going to make a move on. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But what I will say is that there are reports coming out this morning that Manchester United are interested uh, these are Portuguese reports, obviously Sporting Lisbon play in Portugal. Uh, we've been down this road with many a Portuguese-based uh, player before. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. Um, I think he ticks a lot of the boxes for what Manchester United may be interested in, apart from one. Um, obviously, Rasmus is here. They will have been on international duty together. But to be fair, this story precedes the international break. Holman is a player that's been linked to Manchester United probably for six or seven months now. Um, the interesting thing is, he's, it's his first season in sport, for Sporting in Portugal. Uh, he signed for them last summer. I think it was about 18 million euros um, from Lecce uh, in Serie A, and uh, where he spent a couple of years there. So, I mean, look, the, the question again has to be, why are Man United dropping on these players late? Um, because as um, as VK Dean says, he's not going to be cheap. Um, Sporting Lisbon apparently have a release clause of 60 million euros on him. 
they only spent 80 million euros on him a year ago. So again, this is something that Manchester United need to solve massively. We need to get into the rhythm of rhythm. Uh, we need to get into that rhythm of finding these players before they go to the club that are going to rinse you dry. And Man United, over the last 10 years, our whole transfer strategy is on letting somebody, letting another club buy somebody, scout somebody cheap, and then we will buy, we will buy them high. You know, whether that's Bruno, whether that's Sancho, um, whether it's Harry Maguire, you know, whether it's Aaron Wambasaka, we always buy high. And we need to be looking to buy players low if we are to be um, if we are to be um, a club that moves forward. So, really interesting player, Morton Hulman um, or Hulman. Um, really, really good season for Sporting. Um, exactly the type of player you would want at Manchester United if you can tr transition from the Portuguese league to the Premier League. Um, exactly the right age, tenacity, tackle, pass. Yeah, he'd be brilliant as a player to bring in. I mean, I'm not saying he'd be an, he would be successful in the Premier League, but he certainly has all the attributes to do it in a position that we need it. And certainly Manchester United will have scouted him. Uh, the J in Holman is very vocal. Hojman. There you go, says Havard. There we go. Um, so anyway, I think he's a player that would be very interesting. The, the problem I'm going to say about this is that, one, when you speak to people in the know, it's not very advanced at all, and it's not a priority, um, i.e. Fabrizio. Um, the holding midfielder is not a priority for Manchester United, and if it's not a priority for Manchester United, there's not a lot of money put aside for that type of player. So that's that's the one, really. Um where are we going to find 60 million quid from um, is is on a holding midfielder is, is very, very unlikely. Um, and second of all, my point is that exactly is that we we won't have that amount, that amount of money for a holding midfielder. When you think about the priorities of striker, centre-backs, maybe even a winger, maybe a full-back, I, I don't see Man United delving into an area which I still think is absolutely massive. I mean, if I go back to the Brentford game, if I go back to the Brentford game, then the midfield is where that game was lost for 90 minutes. Um, so, yeah, I, I think when I look at it, it's it, it goes it goes back to that. Um, I, I'm amazed how badly people analyse Manchester United. Actually, um, whether it's pundits, fans, whatever, I, I can't believe people do not analyse Manchester United in the right way. Yeah. We do need centre-backs that can play high up the pitch, 100%. I, I agree with that. But Brentford dominated that game. How do you dominate a game of football? You dominate the midfield. And our midfield, whether you know whether it's a Kobe Mainu loving or a McTominay's crap, whatever like that, that midfield got dominated. Now, that's not Mainu's fault. I, I think it's McTominay's fault, to be honest with you. I think it's Bruno's fault. But that midfield got absolutely swamped. What are we going to do next season to stop that happening? Like, I don't see anything that's going to happen next year that's going to change our midfield getting absolutely swamped. And I can't believe it's not being discussed enough. That midfield gets absolutely rinsed because it gets overrun. And the only two players that can play in that midfield to compete are Casemiro and Maynou. And that's it. And they can't play 60 games together. That can't happen. So I don't know why we're not prior prioritising this Morton guy from Sporting Lisbon or Edison from Atalanta because we absolutely should be looking at two centre-backs and two midfielders because, you know, keeping Scott McTominay to prance about that midfield trying to goal-hang and get in everyone's way is not going to make Man United a dominant force in the midfield. Far from it. So I think that what we need to do is um, be looking to bring these types of players in, but there's absolutely no story or, or credibility around Manchester United going hard in the market for a, for a holding midfielder. And I don't get it. I don't understand it. Because if I said to you about Casemiro, there'd be a lot of people saying, well, with Casemiro, I just don't know. I don't know about Casemiro, whether he's the right man. Is he get, is, are his legs going? He's injury prone. Kobe Mainu's an eight. So who's the six? We haven't fucking got one. And if we're going to turn Kobe Mainu into a number six, by the way, I think we're going to waste one of the potentially best number eights we've had in an England shirt for the last 20 years. Um, and you can clip me on that. I think if we're going to turn Kobe Mainu into a number six, we're going to waste potentially one of the best number eights we've had in 20 years. I genuinely believe that. Like, this is a lad who can take people on, 
This is a lad who can transition and carry the ball 10, 20 metres. That is not a holding midfielder. That is a number eight. And if we're going to use Mainu as a six because we can't be asked to go into the transfer market and buy one, then we're bigger idiots than I thought. So, you know, clip that up and wrap it up with a bow because I'm not, I'm not joking. It's not April Fool's. That's a fact. If that's the plan to turn Mainu into a six so we can accommodate people like Mason Mount and fucking McTominay, then we're idiots because he's the best number eight we've got and we need to be developing him. It would be like taking Ganacho and putting him at right back. That's what that's what I think playing Mainu as a six is. It's like taking Ganacho and putting him at right back. You are you are clipping his feathers and, and he won't be able to fly. Um we should get Danny Elmo, he's better than Brunos's crypto. We don't need to buy a holding midfielder. We do not need to buy a holding midfielder. Uh, sorry, we do need to buy a holding midfielder. We don't need to buy an attacking midfielder. We've got enough. Uh, Ryan Crozier, welcome to Members Club. Thank you very much for that. So yeah, interesting couple of stories on Bremer and uh, Hullman, but we will see what happens with that because I don't think we can. Have, I don't think we're looking for a holding midfielder, and I don't think we have the money for it. And Bremer, I think, is just a massive smokescreen. Uh, to be honest with you, but look, I, you know, I know it's a new show, but we wander into areas, and we can wander into this area again. We lost to. We, we didn't lose to Brentford. We should have lost to Brentford. Um, you know, I actually saw a fan yesterday say if we'd won that game against Brentford with um, with that Mount goal, most Man United fans would have contributed to a GoFundMe to reimburse Brentford with two points. Like, it's true, isn't it? You know, and I love that about football because football fans can be really, really red tinted glasses bias. But I don't think there's a Man United fan out there that if we'd won that game, wouldn't have sat there and said, you know what, it is... Um, it would have been a robbery. It would have been a robbery, definitely. But, as I said, Fulham dominated our midfield. Brighton dominated our midfield. Crystal Palace dominated our midfield, all at home. And Brentford dominated our, field at the weekend, our midfield at the weekend. At some point, you've got to stop talking about inverted fullbacks. You've got to stop talking about the number 10. You've got to stop talking about the centre-backs. And you've got to add another problem. The midfield is an absolute joke. An absolute joke. And... What are we going to do about it? Because I don't see any change next season if we don't buy midfielders. Even if we buy good centre-backs, I don't see any change because Casemiro, if he stays, gets injured, Kobe Mayno has to play as a six and we're screwed again. It's not good enough. We've got to be buying midfielders. We're miles off. Uh, Kelvin has gifted 10 memberships. Thank you very much. Um, oh, that just reminds me, actually, before we talk about Sancho and something else. Um... Saw something at the weekend. I don't know how accurate this is. This is just a tweet on Twitter. But um, maybe one of you geniuses knows. Um, big shout out, Kelvin. Ten memberships. Sort of gifted one. I can just see that uh, David has just got one as well. Um, big shout out to Kelvin with the win this morning. We're not early, by the way. A few people are saying, why is the show so early? We're not early. It's not April Fool's. It's a bank holiday in the UK. But we're not early. It's 10 o'clock. It's 20 past 10 in the UK. It might be 20 past nine where you are, but the clocks went forward on Saturday night in the UK for British summertime. So it's 20 past 10. It's the 10 o'clock show. It's not 20 past nine. It might be where you are, but that's something you need to figure out because we will be live at 10 o'clock every morning. So a few people are saying, why are you so early? Uh, we're not early. Um, we're, we're at the normal time. Um, it just takes a bit of adjustment for people. So what I was going to say is that we... Um, there's a rumour going round, and I don't know whether it's true, that apparently when Rasmus went on his goal-scoring run, um, so it started you know, the day after he did the interview with us. Um, I'm not saying we had the magic touch or anything, but we did the interview on the Wednesday morning, and uh, the goal-scoring run started on the Thursday night against Wolves. Um, he went on a goal-scoring run, and a tweet went out yesterday saying that when Rasmus went on his goal-scoring run, McTominay didn't start in any of those games. So people are saying that McTominay is a problem for Rasmus. I would take it another level. I think McTominay is a problem for the team. Um, and what I will say, though, is McTominay doesn't pick himself. This is a Ten Hag problem. So the Ten Hag outers, you can you can fall back on your chair and say Mark's going to say something negative about Ten Hag here. Well, I am. McTominay doesn't pick himself. Um, 
I'll tell you something now, which has been my opinion for a long time. Scott McTominay causes three massive problems in that team that get covered up by Brentford at home and Burnley away or Sheffield United away or whatever. He caught the goals aren't sufficient for the problems. They mask the problem. McTominay goes into areas Rasmus wants to go into. That's very obvious. Very, very obvious. If you watch McTominay, he goes and hangs around in the box for cutbacks where Rasmus would want to be. So that's one problem. We don't need two strikers. So he, one, he goes into Rasmus's areas and I'll, I'll argue that with anybody. He does it all the fucking time. Two, people don't pick up on this one. He also blunts Bruno's game because he goes into Bruno's areas as well. You don't need two, num two attacking midfielders. He's constantly making those late runs into the box, which is a number 10's role. So Bruno doesn't do it. So he's also going into Bruno and Rasmus's space. And he ain't good enough to do either of that. He ain't Frank Lampard. Like, if you've got Frank Lampard in your team making those runs, you're probably going to go, well, Lampard's better than Bruno. Um, but he's not. McTominay's not better than Bruno. And he's not better than Rasmus. So McTominay is wandering into the areas of Bruno and Rasmus. 100%. Bruno doesn't score many goals this season. And Rasmus hasn't been scoring many goals. And I don't think they score any goals when, when McTominay plays. So he wanders into their area. Absolutely. The third one, and I think we all know this, is that Bruno's an attacking midfielder. McTominay basically becomes a false nine. We don't score with every cross into the box. In fact, we get broken on multiple times a game. We get broken on because Scott McTominay and Bruno Fernandes are up there with Rasmus. And there's Kobe Mainu on his own going, oh my God. You know, he's trying to hold back a bloody fire with a water pistol. It, he can't deal with the heat. So there's three big issues with Scott McTominay in this team. One, he goes into Rasmus's area. Two, he goes into Bruno's area. And three, he's so far up the pitch, our midfield gets swamped. You know the role that McTominay plays in that team? Ericsson used to play it. Ericsson used to sit next to Casemiro. We, we talk about our midfield. We've got two attacking midfielders and one holding midfielder this year for most of the season. And it's amazing. And it's a tactical deficiency. Like, what we should have is one sat and one who does support the attack, but primarily supports the six. And we, we, what we've got is one who sits and two who bomb forward. And it doesn't work. And that's a tactical deficiency. Like, I was looking at the bench at the weekend and I was like, tactically, this me, you know what? This is what I thought. And I might get, I might get roasted for this, but I'm still going to say it. I'm watching the game against Brentford with all you good people. And I'm going, we're getting absolutely overrun in the midfield here. Overrun. And I don't mean like they're breaking on us. I mean like they're winning every 50-50. Their passing's crisp. They're quicker than us. They're absolutely dominating us in the midfield. And to be fair, McTominay didn't really get forward that much against Brentford because we didn't get forward. Like, I think I think we, we hardly got in their box. So McTominay actually ended up being even more redundant than he normally is because even when he sits back, he can't do the job. So it's not like if he sat back, he'd be good anyway. He's not. But we got absolutely dominated. They were quicker. They were more productive. They were fitter. They were, they, they were, they were more uh, aggressive. And I was looking at it and I thought, well... You need to keep Mainu on and you desperately need Casemiro on, but maybe Casemiro is not fit. It got to a point where I was like, why don't we bring Casemiro and Amrabat on, take Bruno off and put Mainu as a slightly more advanced midfielder, but have two holding midfielders to try and get a grip on the midfield. Well, that didn't happen. We kept McTominay and Bruno on and we took Mainu off. And I actually thought, well, we're getting so dominated in the midfield. Bring on Mainu, bring on Keep Mainu on, bring on Amrabat and Casemiro, get them to sit, give Mainu a little bit more license and grip that midfield with a bit of fight. And we, you know, we absolutely didn't do that. And it, look, it might not be the best idea, but the principle by the, behind the idea was we're getting absolutely murdered in the midfield by a team that's more aggressive and quicker than us. So put on people that like a scrap. Put Amrabat and Casemiro on and get them to sit as a two. And that let, let Mainu wander forward. 
fucking no chance, do we? What do we we, we take Mainu off and we bring fucking Casemiro on and we keep McTominay and Bruno on? I mean, I, I, it's a tactical deficiency. I do not understand. And um, look, I'm not going to sit here in the Eric Ten Hag fan club anymore. As I said after Saturday. I think questions need to be asked. I'm not Ten Hag out. I don't think sacking Ten Hag is the right thing to do. But what I do, I think what I think you can do is you can be vocally angry and frustrated with this manager while still backing him. Because I'll tell you where that where that principle comes from. He is in danger. Like he is in big danger. And if you just sit there going, don't sack him, don't sack him, it's not his fault, it's not his fault, he probably will get sacked. I think if you want him to stay in a job, you've got to start being vocal about the problems because there can't be a United fan who wants Ten Hag to stay who sat there going, it's not all his fault. Like there, are, I don't think the majority of it's his fault. I think the majority of it is you've got players who just can't be asked to wear a Man United shirt and, and we all know who they are. But he's also making mistakes as well. And I look at that midfield and I look at Chelsea and I think we're going to go against Conor Gallagher, Casido, Enzo Fernandez, and it's going to be Brentford all over again. They are tenacious they are hungry and they will fight for the ball. And I'm thinking, McTominay, Bruno and Maynou, no fucking way. Absolutely not. I genuinely would play Casemiro, Amrabat and Maynou. Like, I really would go and say, we are not losing that midfield battle. We're going to absolutely go at them and fight them in that midfield. I would. I would because I just think that otherwise we're going to walk into the same fucking half an hour again where we're sat on the watch along going, we're getting murdered in the midfield. And... We've been murdered in the midfield all season. And it's something that has to be looked at. So look, I think Scott McTominay is a massive problem in that team. And for three reasons. One, he gets in Rasmus's way. Two, he gets in Bruno's way. And three, he doesn't do the job of a number eight. So it kills us in three different ways. But he doesn't pick himself. The problem here is the, the lad shouldn't be being picked. He shouldn't be anywhere near that team. He, he's a problem. It, it almost makes you play like 10 men. And then you've got people like Rashford who make you play like nine men. And then Bruno make you play like eight men. So we can't afford to carry these players. Like if you want to want to win a game in the Premier League, you've got to play with 11 men. And um, it's a big, big problem. Uh, Robert McCormack says it's an Eric Ten Hag tactic. Mount was told same against Wolves. Mate, I completely agree. I re Robert, I remember the Wolves game as well. There was this massive gap between the defence and the attack. You're absolutely spot on. It's a tactic. McTominay doesn't pick himself. And I do not understand the tactic. It doesn't make any sense. And if he keeps with it, he will lose his job. He needs to get a grip of that midfield or he will lose the job. And that, that, it's as simple as that. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the news. A uh, bit, of, bit of news coming in last night from Sky Sports that um, Manchester United's owners, Ineos, will look to recoup a large majority of the £73 million paid for Jadon Sancho. Now, Sancho is doing a little bit better for Dortmund at the moment. Um, it's about bloody time, to be honest, and it's not breaking news. I mean, he, it's the German league. He should be doing well in that league. He's a decent player. Um, but are Manchester United likely to recuperate a large proportion of Jadon Sancho's wa wages and transfer fee this summer transfer window, considering Manchester United paid 73 million pounds for it um i i throw this over to you i i don't know where manchester united are seriously thinking about recuperating that money and look ineos have done a lot of talking lately about what they're going to do what they're not going to do and i think it's about time um to see that happening with ineos but honestly i would file this story under a load of crap i know it's coming from sky but when, when, when was Sky any good on transfers anyway? We're, we're not going to recuperate £60 million for Jadon Sancho. We're not, we're not going to recuperate 50 So the story is dead in the water. Um, Ineos are looking to recuperate a large chunk of the £73 million for um, Jadon Sancho is the headline. Well, a large chunk of £73 million has got to be north of £55 million. We're not getting that. We're not getting... I, I don't think we'll even get 35. I, I, I think he'll go on loan again. Uh, uh, you know, he's on he's on £300,000 a week and we paid £73 million for him. We are not getting anybody apart from Saudi Arabia to do that and there ain't no way he's going to Saudi Arabia. Not at all. He's not even 25. He ain't going to go and play in Saudi Arabia. So 
Ineos can, uh, sh you know, this is a story I would try and detract myself from a straight away because it's not a story that Ineos are putting out there because they can't do that. They're not miracle workers. You're not going to get that amount of money for Jaden Sancho. Who is interested in Jaden Sancho for a start? Um, I was speaking to somebody a couple of weeks ago. Spurs were looking at him in the January transfer window as a loan deal because Ange likes him and thinks he can get more out of him. And I think Ange might be able to get something out of him for a year. But as we know with Sancho, can he keep consistent for more than a year? Um, he's got his own issues off the field, as we've seen. Can he do that? So if Spurs think they can do it, the price is 50 million. But I don't think Daniel Levy is stupid enough to go and do a deal like that. There's no other Premier League club that's going to go anywhere near him for the price of and the wage. I think the only avenue, La Liga clubs can't afford him. Italian clubs can't afford him. Bundesliga clubs can't afford him. Itali English clubs don't want him and can't afford him anyway. So the only logic... Jadon Sancho is going to be a problem for Manchester United longer than this summer because we're not going to bring him back. Well, unless Ten Hag gets sacked and then we might bring him back, which I think would be... I don't want him back. I don't... I don't. You know why I don't want Jadon Sancho back? I wish him all the best. And I really, really wanted him. And, um, you know, I was absolutely obsessed with this signing him a couple of years ago. Um, I don't want him back. The reason I don't want him back is I don't forgive him for downing tools on the fans. I don't care about... You know, when, when you, we, we read about the players aren't playing for the manager. And what people never understand about that is that they're not playing for the fans. If players think they're downing tools for the manager, then they're thicker than I give them credit. Because when you down tools for a manager... The manager's just an employee of the club. You down club, you down to, you down tools for the fans. I, I, I hate it when the media say the players are downing tools for the manager because they're not downing tools for the manager. They're downing tools for the fans. They're not, but but some players don't aren't intelligent enough to think that. If you don't put effort in for a manager, then you're not putting. You, you know the reason people get frustrated with Rashford is not because they think he's not putting an effort in for the manager. It's because they can visibly see. It doesn't look like he gives a shit in a Man United shirt and that hurts fans because we care. So when a player doesn't fight for a manager, they're not fighting for the fans. So when Jadon Sancho refused to apologise and didn't play for Man United for three months at the start of this season, I don't really care who's wrong or right between Ten Hag and Sancho. If, it was just, if it's just between them, that's fine. But when he refuses to apologise, then he refuses to play for Man United and... That level of arrogance, I don't want anywhere near a Man United shirt. So, look, I don't do Player FC. If you do, and I know some of you do, that's absolutely fine. And if you want to make an excuse for it, that's absolutely fine. Because you're a fan like everybody else. But as a fan, I don't want a player that puts their own selfish needs ahead of that of the club that pays you. And I don't care who was in the right between Sancho and Ten Hag. All I know is that player wouldn't apologise and put what was best for the fans ahead of what was best for himself. So that is not the type of player I want at this club because we've already got enough players that put themselves ahead of the benefit of this football club, as we saw on Saturday. We don't need another player that downs tools. And also, on the pitch, last year in Turkey, he plays a crap pass to Malassia, doesn't even track back. Everyone else does. So from what I've seen of Sancho, I don't see a player that is the type of player that we need at Manchester United. I don't see a personality or work ethic that we need at Man United. We need wingers who are going to track back and work hard, and Sancho won't do that. So I don't want that type of player at Manchester United. And that might be a bit harsh for you on a Monday morning, but I think there's enough evidence there. I won't control if he comes back. If he comes back and he starts tracking back like Mo Salah, and he starts playing like Mo Salah... That everybody deserves a second chance. But based on what I know at the moment, I don't want him anywhere near Manchester United, regardless of who the manager is. So that's my stance on it. And you're free to make your own choice. Could he come back to Manchester United? Well, I, I, I don't see Sancho not being a Man United player next year. I, I, I think he will still be a Manchester United player next season. I think the most likely thing is we will loan him again. Um, he could come back if there's a different manager, of course. He could be there on the tour, etc. Um, it's not impossible. But I don't see him being sold this summer because I don't see a club being able to do it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't. I, I, I don't. I don't see it. Um, so, yeah. 
I, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it will happen. Um, I really don't. Uh, Doc Tommy says it's re recoup. Mark recuperate means get means getting better. I don't know what you're talking about, mate. Um, if you're talking about the headline that uh, Ineos are looking to recoup uh, 73 million pounds from the uh, Jaden Sancho deal, that's not the way it was meant, and that's not the way to interpret it. What it means is they want to recover as much money as they can from the 73 million pounds that they paid. That was the headline. That was the story. I listened to it. Uh, and we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. I think the absolute limit we will get is some sort of deal with Dortmund that Dortmund can't even afford. So I, I don't look with regards to the transfer window. Surely talk to me. What do you think about this summer transfer window? Because you've got to get realistic. You can't just sit there and say, we're going to sell Sancho. We're going to sell McTominay. We're going to sell Greenwood. We're going to sell Maguire. And we're going to buy Osman. Like when the, there, is a, there is a level of reality that we have to walk into this transfer window with. And there isn't a lot of money at the club because we can't afford to spend £20 million on Dan Ashworth. We haven't got a lot of money. And... There isn't a market for Jaden Sancho. There, there, at the moment, there isn't a market. There is Dortmund who like him and he likes Dortmund, and that's it. There is no other club going. We're going to get the we're going to get the money out. And the problem with that is the problem that um, Ineos have inherited. They have a lot of problems that they're going to really struggle to solve. Um, they are inheriting ridiculous contracts. They are inheriting unsolvable issues. Let's bring Anthony into this. I mean, I thought Anthony was shit against Brentford and he hadn't been on international duty. I thought it was absolutely crap. Um, call, call it what it is. I thought Anthony was fucking rubbish against Brentford. And he wasn't the only one. I'm just saying a lot of people have said Bruno was crap and Rashford was crap. Well, I thought Anthony was crap as well. He can't be sold. £80 million, pounds, 200 grand a week. He's unsellable. Jaden Sancho can't be sold. £73 million, pounds, 300 grand a week. He's unsellable. Marcus Rashford can't be sold. Only one year into a 300 and something grand a week contract. Doesn't want to go. So all these things that potentially need to be done can't be done. And that's why I think it's really dangerous when Ineos start putting PR out that they're going to revolutionise Man United. They're going to get ruthless with Man United. They're going to dictate the style of play. And that, that's what that's how we're going to play. I mean, I think Ineos have said a lot of good things. I think the most dangerous... There's always a headline that comes back and haunts people if things go wrong. And I think the thing that always... The thing that sticks in my head about the, um, the various sound bites that have come out from Ineos is that we will dictate the way this football club plays. And that is what our manager and players will do. I think that's an amazingly positive line. But I think it's a mission impossible. Because if you can't be ruthless and you can't be aggressive, you can't deliver on that. So Man City can deliver on that. Liverpool can deliver on that. Arsenal are now beginning to deliver on that. We can't deliver on that. We, we can't deliver on that. And people say, you're having a laugh. Of course we can deliver on that. The owners can decide how we play and then the manager and the players have to do it. But it's not that easy when you're hamstrung by the fact that you're stuck with players that can't play the way you want to play. You can't sit there and say, we're going to play a high line, high possession game where we create loads of chances and we concede hardly any goals. You can set that as your vision, but how do you deliver that when you, your manager says, whoever it is, yeah, you know you're asking the impossible. I can't do that. We'll do it. But I can't do that because I've got six players that you can't sell who are on massive money who can't play that way. What, what do you want me to do? I can't do it. We'll just get on with it. Well, you're going to have to sack me then, aren't you? Because I can't do it. I can't play high possession football with a high line. When I've got people like Rashford, Bruno, McTominay, Maguire, Lindelof, wan you know, these players are good players, but they can't play that style of play. So, and you can't sell them and you won't buy me replacements. And that is going to be the problem. I agree with what's his face. It's a three to five year plan. That's exactly where I was going to go. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, 
it, it's going to take a very long time. And this is where I think we need to get realistic. There's a lot of posturing. There's a lot of talk. There is no definition on the timeline. And what's his face is absolutely correct. And that's, that's what I was going to say. This to me is a three to five year plan. If Ineos are genuinely going to sit there at the top of the tree and say, we're in charge, we're going to dictate how we play and we want to play like Liverpool or we want to play like Arsenal, they're going to take three to five years to do it because they're stuck with players that can't do it that they're not going to remove from this football club. I mean, I, I heard someone on the radio last night saying, United, United fans, they're obsessed with us playing this brand of football that we all want to play. But you are never going to play it whilst Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford are in that team. They cannot do that. If you want to play quick counter-attacking football, they're perfect. If you want to play up in the final third against the low block and be patient, they can't do it. They're just they're, they're, they're too busy. They, they don't want to do it and they can't do it. And then the person went on to say, and those two players are going to be here for at least the next two years, maybe three or four. And, they're, and while they're here... They will always be in the team because they're so powerful in the dressing room. So it's a contradiction that's going on at Man United at the moment where people are talking about this brave new world under Ineos where we're going to start playing really attacking football and you know we're going to be really patient in the final third and probe like Liverpool and Arsenal and Man City. And people are getting really excited about it and they're kissing the arse of Sir Jim and they're going, yeah, 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 we're going to do it. And actually, it's not going to happen because two, 50% of our front four aren't going anywhere, can't play like that and aren't going to go anywhere for two or three years. So how the hell are we going to play that brand of football in the next three years when Rashford and Bruno aren't going anywhere and they're never going to sit on the bench? They're always going to be in the first team and they can't play that brand of football. So what the hell are we all thinking is going to happen in the next two or three years when it's a fact that those two players are very good players, but they can't play like Man City, Arsenal, Liverpool, Spurs, Villa. They can't do it. So unless football is going to change and counter-attacking football is going to become the new tiki-taka, we're not going to win anything because we've got two massively paid, massively influential players who suit counter-attacking football down to the ground. If you were building a team in Real Madrid and you wanted to build the best counter-attacking team in the world, you'd go and buy Rashford and Bruno because they're brilliant at it. But if you want to build a team that is a modern team, that is patient in possession and dominates high up the pitch, we've got two players that will be playing for this club for the next two to three years who cannot do it. And it was a, and it was a very, very, very good point. Very, very good point. Because people don't want to have those conversations. They don't. They want to drift from game to game and then Bruno scores. Sit down, Bruno haters. No, I'll stand up actually because the point still remains. We can't play the brand of football that's going to win titles. We can win the odd game. We could beat Chelsea. We might beat Liverpool. We can have sporadic wins, but we won't have the consistency that is required to win a Premier League title. We will not see it. We've been waiting for it for the last five years. And this set of players cannot produce consistency. And it's not toxic. It's not negative. It's reality. We've been watching this set of players under numerous, numerous managers for three, four years now. And they cannot produce consistently. We've literally just had it land on our doorstep as if it was delivered by Amazon Prime. We beat Liverpool in an epic, great game. And then we go to Brentford and shit all over Saturday Night TV. That is United. We beat Man City from 2-0 down at the Etihad. Next week, we lose to West Brom at home, who got relegated. We've been doing this for years. Good result, bad result. Couple of good results, bad result. Three months of good results, two months of bad results. Inconsistency. This team is riddled with it. And if you want to if you want to be at the top of the tree and say, we will dictate how this team is going to play and we want to play like Liverpool, then you've got to clear out at the bottom. Like, like the bottom of a rabbit's hutch that's been left for a week. You've got to scoop it out, get the hoover out, get it all out, clean it out and then re-bed it. And United won't do that. They're going to leave some of the shit at the bottom and put some fresh straw down or sawdust or whatever. And the shit will still be there. It's not going to happen. And I think we need to wake up to this. We're not going to start playing like Liverpool next season. We're not going to start playing like Arsenal the season after. It's not going to happen. We've got too many first team players that can't play that style of play. Look, if you're getting rid of people like Ericsson, Lindelof, you can do it. But when you're when you're when you're when you're saying you've, to play a certain brand of football, you've got to get rid of three or four first teamers. We're not going to do that. 
we're not going to get rid of three or four first team players. Um, we're not going to play a good brand of football for the next two or three years. I just don't see it. There's too many players that are fundamentally powerful in that dressing room that will not be removed. Ineos can talk all they like about this is our club and we're going to make big decisions. You're not going to make big decisions, I don't think. You, you, there is no way you would sell Rashford. There is no way you would sell Bruno. You won't even sell McTominay. So on the one hand, we're going to do all this. And on the other hand, when you actually think it, they're not. They're not. They're not going to do it. And I'm I'm not being negative here. I'm not calling players out. I'm, I want Ineos to do well. But I know, and you know, when you move, remove your head from the clouds of fantasy, we're going to play this brilliant brand of football. But you know they're not going to sell Rashford. They're not going to sell Bruno. They're not going to sell McTominay. They probably won't sell Maguire or Lindelof. Like, they probably won't sell wan -Bissaka. But to be fair, Maguire, Lindelof and wan are not the players that are going to get us playing like Liverpool. It's the attack. It's the midfield. If they're not going to sell those players, then those players will keep getting picked and we won't be able to play it. Basically, it's like this. If your car has got a flat tyre and you want to get to Cornwall and that flat tyre is going to prevent you and you change everything about that car, but you don't change the flat tyre, you're still not going to get to Cornwall. No matter what you do with the rest of the car, clean it, get a better engine, get three other better tyres, you still got a flat tyre. And this is what United have been doing for years. We leave the flat tyre because for, for some reason and we spend money on everything else and we've still got a flat tyre. And Man United's flat tyre is inconsistency and inability to play good football. And we will still have that flat tyre next year. Regard oh, Tadebo, Elise, Branthwaite. Oh, walking in like a boss. Oh, Ineos are walking in like a boss. You know the Twitter accounts will be doing it. I'm hearing this. Yes. Oh, well, change, change, change. Until they change the flat tyre, when, 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 what changes? It doesn't matter who we buy in the summer. If we start next season, McTominay, Bruno and Rashford are in the starting lineup. we ain't playing good football. We've got to play counter-attacking football. Unless a miracle happens. And this is the miracle we all need. Unless... Bruno and Rashford suddenly become possession-based players. We've solved it. But we've been waiting for that for a very long time. Do you think Rasmus would must score more in a top team, says Fatboy? Mate, absolutely 100%. I mean, I've, I've been seeing a little bit of uh, Rasmus uh, dislike again in the um, on social media. And I'm just like, I can't believe we have these morons in our fan base. I mean, it's it's right up there with going in on Ganacho. Um, I, I just don't get it. I mean, we showed it last night, didn't we? He had one shot and three touches in the box compared to Tony who had nine shots and 12 touches in the box. Like, if you put Rasmus in an Arsenal team or a Spurs team or a Villa team, he'll score goals. Strike it. Look at, look, look at Erling Haaland yesterday. If you didn't know Erling Haaland was the best striker in the world and you watched that game yesterday, you'd think he was crap. Barely won a 50-50. Link-up play was awful. Didn't get a chance on goal. And that's the best striker in the world. But if you watched Erling Haaland yesterday, you would, you would give him a five. Five out of ten. I've always said this about the graveyard shift of a striker. It's I always felt guilty giving Ronaldo a five or Cavani a five. But they had to have a five because they hadn't done anything. But as a striker, you're only as good as the service you get. As a midfielder... You, you have a good game or you have a bad game because everything is going on around you. But as a striker, your performance is based on what, what others provide you. So Rasmus had a crap game against Brentford and Haaland had a crap game against Arsenal because they're service dependent. Like, they don't get the ball. And if you give them the ball and they miss chances, you can give them a bad 5 out of 10. But if you give these players the ball, they will score goals. And um, Rasmus in a better team would score a lot of goals, yeah. Um, most of Rasmus's goals are self-generated as well. People still don't realise that. Um, you, you, you should be all over this. Ivan Tony's had more shots on goal this season than Rasmus, and Rasmus has played all season, and Ivan Tony only started in mid-January. That's a horrible tactical um, uh, drama for, for Ten Hag. Uh, United ego is bigger than Anana's booty, says LeBron. Do you think Rasmus have done that one? If Sancho, Greenwood, McTominay and Maguire don't go and Varane do go, how is this different to the Glazers? Mate, this summer's going to be really interesting, Orlif. 
I will praise Ineos to the heavens if they do amazing things. But I suspect we might see more of the same. Without a new sporting director, it's going to be bad, says John. Thank you very much. Right, anyway, look, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. We're not early. We're not early. It's it, it's literally 10 to 11 in the UK. We're not early. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, love the show this morning. Some real talk in there as well. That's what it's all about. I love the passion when it gets real, when we're talking about the midfield. And I absolutely just want to say, you took this show from an 8 to a 10 on that little section about three to five years from What's-His-Face. Absolutely nailed it. This bullshit belief that United and Ineos are going to walk in and wave a magic wand and we're going to play like Liverpool or Arsenal when the fundamental truth is 50% of our front four is going to be here for the next three years and they can't play the way Liverpool and Arsenal play. So how the fuck are we going to play like them when we're going to be keeping players that can't do it? who are massively powerful in that dressing room. So, you know, Ineos need to do something amazing or really it's just talk. Let's see. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, Eight o'clock show tonight. It's a bank holiday. We might not have a two o'clock show. I might actually do FIFA career mode, actually. Um, we'll see. But uh, certainly back at eight o'clock tonight and then obviously back to normal tomorrow because we're building towards Chelsea on Thursday. It's a bank holiday in the UK for Easter weekend. Take care, everyone. Absolutely brilliant show. Loved that. I love the little niche chats we get here in this community. You're absolutely amazing. I'll speak to you in a bit.